ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar organized by the Elise Foundation and Liberal Friends. My name is Gijs Schwarzenberg and I will be your moderator tonight. A big thank you goes to the many people who helped make this webinar possible. As our support group grows and grows, not a chance that I can name everyone individually. But I would like to mention Wouter van Kaspel, who's at the controls tonight for the first time. And again, we are very proud to present tonight's program to you. So let's take a quick look. In five minutes, uh, Jessica Johnson of Foratom will start the first presentation, and it's called the Sustainable Finance Taxonomy with or without nuclear. Then at uh, eight o'clock, uh, we have uh, Rogier Potter van Lom, uh, how to match the zero carbon with Dutch Zunigheid, an economic analysis of the societal business case for nuclear energy. And for the English speakers among us, uh, Zunigheid, I think you translate as frugality. By Rogier Potter van Lom. Then at uh, 20 minutes past eight, around hitting the limits, Matthijs Beckers of the Elise Foundation, and Matthijs will be talking about uh, limits that uh, materials put on the energy transition. Then after each presentation, there will be some room for clarif clarifying questions, and we will have some more room after the last pre presentation. And then and, uh, at uh, uh, 2040, we'll, we'll start our panel discussion. Uh, we have two extra guests, and those will be Jan Huytema and Silvio Erkens. Jan Huytema is of the European Parliament for the VVD, and Silvio Erkens is for the uh, House of Parliament uh, in, uh, uh, for the VVD. We will finish around uh, 21.30, and I am now going to... Um, well, now some, some notice about the questions and answers. Um, the chat box will open during the presentations and questions may be answered by our Q&A team. And if this team can forward questions to the presenters and the guests, if, uh, if they can do that if relevant. And please notice that improper use of the chat box, like sharing this information or unduly large amount of messages will result, will result in your being removed from the webinar. Um, so, like I said, after the presentation, there will be some room for uh, clarifying questions. And uh, after the last question, we will go to the seventh, second part of this uh, webinar, the, our panel discussion. But now let's move quickly to the first presenter. And I will stop sharing my screen and I will ask Jessica Johnson to uh, start sharing her screen while I introduce her to the audience. Uh, Jessica Johnson is the Communication and EU Stakeholders Director at Foratom, the voice of the nuclear industry. She is also in charge of all sustainability matters, in particularly uh, the sustainable finance taxonomy. She joined Foratom in October 2017, and prior to that, she was Communications Director of the Trade Association representing the cement industry, where she also dealt with biodiversity and general circular economy matters. A British national, she grew up in Spain and now has been living in Belgium for more than 20 years. Her work in Brussels made her aware of how considerable the EU's political resistance is to nuclear power. Recently, this has confluenced into two important developments. One is the publication of the Scientific Bureau of the European Commission, the GRC, on the question of whether nuclear energy can comply to the European Union's do no harm principle. The outcome of this scientific study was a resounding yes. That was the easy part. The hard part is the EU's reluctance to draw the obvious conclusion that nuclear should be included in the EU sustainable taxonomy. Traditional environmentalists have difficulty to accept that nuclear can be a very eco-friendly solution. Jessica is going to tell you about the nuclear share in EU's clean energy, about political resistance against a clear scientific conclusion, and about the possible consequences this may have for nuclear energy in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Geis. Uh, indeed, yes, uh, having worked in Brussels for over 20 years, uh, I'd say the most challenging job was the one when I joined the nuclear industry uh, to deal with uh, their communications. 
I want to start maybe on a more positive note. We are starting to see improvements here in Brussels and we are starting to see improvements across the different member states. So from my perspective, we still have a long way to go, but the positive signals are there and we're hoping that we can keep them going on, on track. So I'd like to first of all um, provide you with some basic information about who we are. So Foratom is the trade association which represents the nuclear industry at EU level. Uh, we cover obviously or primarily nuclear energy, but also all the other applications of nuclear. With regards to the nuclear industry, you have here uh, a few key figures uh, in terms of the number of reactors, the number of jobs that are supported by the nuclear industry, and here, when I talk about 1 million jobs, I'm talking about 1 million jobs in Europe, which is very important to bear in mind. You also have the information with regards to electricity production. So generally speaking, nuclear accounts for around about 26% of the electricity produced in the EU. On this slide, you can see uh, the number of reactors which are currently operating in the different member states, as well as some of the nuclear power plants which are currently under construction, for example, Finland, France, and Slovakia. So as I mentioned earlier, 26% of electricity production in the EU comes from nuclear, but in actual fact, nuclear accounts for 50% of the low carbon electricity produced. And that's a really important figure because it is actually the largest source of low carbon electricity in the EU. So coming now to one of the key points of my presentation, the assessment of nuclear under the taxonomy. As mentioned, the Joint Research Centre, which is the scientific arm of the European Commission, conducted an assessment which was made public in March of this year. The point of this assessment was not to identify whether nuclear contributed to climate mitigation's objectives. The reason why was because even the technical experts who'd worked on the broader sustainable finance taxonomy agreed nuclear does contribute to climate mitigation objectives. But what the JRC was asked to focus on is the do no significant harm. These include issues such as the use and protection of water and marine resources, circular economy, pollution prevention and control, and the protection of biodiversity and ecosystems. That was for the first part of their assessment. The second part had to look at the long-term management of high-level radioactive waste and spent nuclear fuel, which remained a key issue in the debate. So what did the JRC conclude? We have here the copy-paste of the text from the report, and this is a very key sentence from a 400 page document. The analysis did not reveal any science-based evidence that nuclear energy does more harm to human health or to the environment than any other electricity production technologies already included in the taxonomy as activities supporting climate change mitigation. Given this, we can conclude that the JRC has found that nuclear is taxonomy compliant. Looking at the environmental criteria, and here I'm talking about the general environmental criteria, overall, the JRC found that the environmental impacts of nuclear are comparable to, and in some cases, even lower than that of other taxonomy compliant power sources. The only area where they indicated that there needs to be careful management is that related to water impacts. So it's to do with the thermal pollution, i.e. the release of the heated up cooling water from a nuclear power plant. This is to do particularly in relation to nuclear power plants that are located next to rivers. We need to ensure that there is sufficient water available in the river for cooling and that at the same time, the temperature of the river does not rise above a certain level. And here, this is why they made, they stress the point that it needs to be carefully managed, whilst at the same time recognizing that there was sufficient legislation in place to ensure that this was done correctly. Looking here in relation to the issue of radioactive waste, 
I want to draw attention to one issue that has already been covered with, by the taxonomy. There's been a lot of debate about carbon capture and storage as a solution for potentially hard to decarbonize sectors or in combination with gas-fired power plants. In this respect, the storage of captured carbon had already been deemed as taxonomy compliant. So if you look at the Delegated Act and the section relating to storage of captured carbon, you will see it is compliant. This issue is relevant to us because the storage facilities for captured carbon bear great similarities to what we've put here as DGR, so deep geological repositories, which is currently being developed in the nuclear industry. And why does it bear great similarities? That is particularly because there is currently no operational geological disposal for CO2. So it is at the same stage as the deep geological repositories for high level radioactive waste. Looking at these deep geological repositories, what the JRC highlighted is that there is broad scientific and technical consensus that they provide an appropriate and a safe solution for high level radioactive waste. Furthermore, there are projects in Finland, France and Sweden which are expected to be operational within the next decade. And here I'd like to draw attention in particular to the project in Finland, the Onkalo repository, which is being constructed by Posiva. You have here an image of what this repository is going to look like and also which high level radioactive waste it will be storing. This is an interesting project because it is already under construction and it is due to be completed by 2025. So we're not far off on this one. The technology itself is Swedish and Sweden is advancing with its own project. It is just waiting for the final permitting. But in addition to the issue of the, the long-term storage of high-level radioactive waste, I also wanted to draw your attention to the fact that we're actually talking about only a very small volume of the waste generated by the nuclear industry. And indeed, you can find here an infographic which we have produced in order to illustrate how the principles of the circular economy are applied within the nuclear industry. The presentation will be shared with you after this event, I hope, and there you will find a link to a full set of information about what we're doing. But you can see already that within the industry, a lot has been done in order to reduce the volumes of waste which are generated. Furthermore, the waste is increasingly being reused. For example, there's technologies which enable the reuse of spent nuclear fuel. Significant amounts of the waste are being recycled. The construction materials, for example, can be fully recycled. They're used in different applications. For example, here, some of the americium and the plutonium can be recycled in medical applications. And then we have the issue of uh, the residual waste. You have the temporary storage. Temporary storage is for those member states which are temporarily storing their spent fuel with the goal of retrieving it and reprocessing it in the future. So it will become a resource once again. For the re remaining very low volumes of residual waste, we have these long-term disposal projects, these deep geological repositories. And here again, the nuclear sector is a leading example in this field. Coming now to the sustainable finance taxonomy, and I would just like to apologize. Unfortunately, I might, well, unfortunately, my three-year-old daughter is at home, hence the noise in the background, but please accept my apologies. Looking now to the EU sustainable finance taxonomy, I want to start with the goal. And the goal of this was to direct investments towards sustainable projects and activities. As for Atom and as the nuclear sector, we were never against this goal. We think it is a good goal. The issue for us is making sure that the policies put in place to achieve this goal are the right ones and that they are based on the science. Because at the end of the day, only science can guide us towards becoming low carbon and sustainable. 
We have here some information about the taxonomy regulation. So the taxonomy regulation itself entered into force in July 2020. And what is really important about this regulation is it makes very clear that the delegated acts or the work continuing on the assessing the different technologies needs to maintain the principle of technology neutrality. That means that they should have assessed each technology against the same criteria to have had this level playing field. As I say, they should have done this. Unfortunately, they did not. You may already be aware of these, but just as a reminder, these are the six environmental objectives against which the different technologies were due to be assessed. So we have climate change mitigation, are they low carbon or not? Climate adaptation, how do they help Europe adapt to the effects of climate change? And do they have any environmental impacts? And these are the four remaining criteria which I mentioned earlier and which we often refer to as the do no significant harm criteria. What is the impact of this legislation or what is the impact of this whole project? The Commission up until now has tried to be has tried to say that this taxonomy should be treated as a voluntary tool. But unfortunately, this is not the case for several reasons. Firstly, because we are seeing a push for EU funds to be linked to taxonomy compliant. By that, I mean that in the future, these linkages could require or could call for only taxonomy compliant technologies having access to EU funds. We also have the European Investment Bank. Under the European Investment Bank, they have these so-called energy lending criteria. Up until now, nuclear has been eligible for EIB lending. Why? Because the EIB confirms that nuclear is low carbon. However, these lending criteria will be adapted this year, next year, in the short term, and they will be adapted to bring them in line with the taxonomy, i.e. in future, only taxonomy compliant activities will have access to those funds. There's the broader policy perspective. We're seeing these EU Green Deal. We have the Fit for 55 package coming up. We have this so-called Just Transition Fund. All of these policies make reference to the taxonomy regulation. And thus, by making reference to the taxonomy regulation, they will be increasingly calling for taxonomy compliance. Finally, we also have the reporting aspects. As of the 1st of January of next year, Companies covered by the non-financial reporting directive will need to report on the share of their activities which are considered as taxonomy compliant or taxonomy non-compliant, meaning that companies in the nuclear field, despite the fact that they may be some of the most decarbonized utilities in Europe, they may have to list themselves as taxonomy non-compliant, thus affecting potential investment. We are already starting to see the effects of this taxonomy. As you know, the EU has put in place uh, this post-COVID recovery plan, where countries can have uh, putting forward their recovery and resilience plans, which will allow them access to finance for those projects. Under the legislation, 37% of the money must be earmarked for projects which are taxonomy compliant. And the decision has already been taken. Nuclear cannot be listed as taxonomy compliant because it was not in the draft. Furthermore, for the remaining funds, they, might, they must meet the principle of do no significant harm. Again, linking that back to the taxonomy. What is the status of this file today? Coming back to the technical expert group, which worked in 2019 and 2020 in order to assess the different criteria and provide their assessment to the European Commission. This technical expert group concluded that they did not have the right expertise to assess nuclear. So we can already say that it was a good response that they were able to recognise this fact and they didn't try and take a decision on a topic of which they did not have the right knowledge. What they did, however, say is that they couldn't be sure that nuclear does not cause harm. 
And here, what they drew particular attention to was the lack of a deep geological repository for radioactive waste in operation today. And that is why the JRC report was done in two parts, because they needed to cover this second point, as it was the one most clearly flagged by the technical expert group. And finally, they recommended that the Commission invite a group of experts with an in-depth knowledge of the nuclear life cycle to conduct the assessment. And this is what led the Commission to mandate the JRC to do this work. But let's be very clear, there's been a lot of misinformation about this. Nuclear was neither included nor excluded from the taxonomy. And we regularly hear that the fact that it was not listed meant that it was excluded and nothing else needed to be done. This is not the case at all. Their conclusion was actually inconclusive, awaiting the work of other experts. This is going more into the technicalities of the file, but once they have the regulation, they had to put in place these delegated acts. The first delegated act covering the climate adaptation and climate mitigation criteria of the taxonomy was sent for what we call scrutiny on the 4th of June of this year. By scrutiny, it's a special procedure whereby the European Parliament and the Council have four months, which can be extended a further two months, to either adopt or reject the draft delegated act. So what does this draft delegated act contain? Essentially, it covers certain power producing technologies, but unfortunately applies varying criteria. And this is where I was coming to where I made reference to the fact that this taxonomy was not based on science, it was more based on, on politics. In our opinion, in order for it to have really been able to assess whether a, uh, a technology was compatible or not, they should have started with the criteria, for example, volume of raw materials required, land area required, volume of waste generated, etc., and apply those criteria in exactly the same way to each technology within a specific sector. Unfortunately, they did not do this, and sometimes it felt as if a decision had been already taken on the technologies they wanted in or out, and so the criteria were adapted in order to achieve the required outcome. I give you here one example from our infographic. This information comes from the International Panel on Climate Change. You can see here the comparison of greenhouse gas emis emissions per power source. Nuclear and wind have the lowest, followed by hydropower, followed by solar, CSP, and solar PV. Now, why do I draw attention to this? Well, first of all, as I said, nuclear is not in the Delegated Act. So we can leave nuclear to one side. However, the other four are. In the case of wind and solar, there is no requirement for those two technologies to meet the CO2 threshold of 100 grams of CO2 uh, equivalent per kilowatt hour of electricity produced, which is fine. It was stated the reason why they do not have to conduct the assessment and meet that criteria is because they are clearly under that threshold. And indeed, when you look at this information from the IPCC, that is the case. However, we take hydropower, which as you can see is below solar. Yes, it is more than wind and nuclear, but it is still below solar. In the case of hydropower, they do need to, for each project, provide the life cycle emissions analysis to demonstrate that they are under that threshold. We would question this because, as I said, hydro, it's lower than solar. Therefore, why should hydro be subjected to conducting that assessment for each project when solar is not? And this is just one example of how technologies have been treated differently. There are many more. Where are we in terms of the assessment of nuclear? So as we have seen, the JRC assessment is positive. However, there are still two additional groups of experts which have been reviewing the work and are due to produce an opinion at the end of June. 
We understand that those two opinions are finalized. I had hoped that I would have the results in time for this webinar, unfortunately not, but we have understood that they could potentially be made available as early as tomorrow. We'll wait and see. The two groups conducting these opinions is first of all, the Article 31 group of the Euratom Treaty, which is composed of independent radio protection and public health experts. And the second one is a subgroup of the Scientific Committee on Health, Environment and Emerging Risks. And this one falls under DG Sante. This latter group is composed of a broader range of uh, experts, including doctors, toxicologists, etc. Jessica, a question from the audience. Was this uh, additional review planned beforehand or was this an, uh, something that's added on after the results of the GRC came public? No, this original review was already announced uh, back in June of last year. So this had already been foreseen. Thank you. Depending on the conclusions of the two expert groups, the commission plans to include nuclear under a so-called complementary delegated. So essentially it would be a delegated act that is complementary to that first delegated act that I mentioned earlier. But we have a lot of questions on timings. As of today, I've received four different dates as to when that could occur. September, October, November, December. So we have no guarantee on when that complementary delegated com will come out. Secondly, there's the issue of the process. First of all, they will issue it, then there will be a one month public consultation, then they will review it, and then it will go for scrutiny. So in actual fact, it will not be adopted before May 2022 at the very earliest which will be much later than the first delegated act and will therefore already have a negative impact on the nuclear industry. For example, as I mentioned, the reporting requirements, reporting is required as of the 1st of January next year, which means that for the first part of the reporting, companies will have to list nuclear as taxonomy non-compliant. There's also the fact that the issue remains very political. Nuclear may still be excluded, regardless of the science. And we know this because we have received information that the Commission could potentially take a political decision over the summer to exclude the nu nuclear, even if the two opinions concur with that of the JRC. So we know the Commission or certain people within the Commission are still very reluctant to add nuclear to the taxonomy. I can summarize the issues that we have with this, I think, on three points. First of all, financing. Nuclear projects have very high upfront costs. Therefore, access to affordable long-term finance is key. If investors are discouraged from investing in taxonomy non-compliant activities and nuclear is left as a non-compliant activity, that means that we would have access to less finance on the market. This is important in countries where there is a preference for private investment to support nuclear projects. There's also the issue that the tax, there are calls for the taxonomy to be linked to state aid in the future, i.e. to review the state aid guidelines and to state that only taxonomy compliant technologies can have access to state aid. This is of course, of great importance to other member states where state aid is partly used to finance the project. Policy, as I mentioned, it's going to influence all future EU policy. That could negatively aff affect the nuclear industry. It, we could find ourselves excluded from all future policy as a result. Also because the Commission is planning to push for international initiatives on sustainable finance to be based on the EU taxonomy. So if it's out of the EU taxonomy, it could impact projects around the world. And finally, there's a messaging issue. Nuclear is a low carbon sustainable technology. There are increasing studies that confirm that decarbonization cannot be achieved without nuclear. We have the IPCC that's confirmed this. We have the IEA that's confirmed this. And we also have a recent report by the United Nations Economic Committee for Europe, which confirms that nuclear is sustainable. So just some concluding thoughts. First of all, as I mentioned, we need to listen to the science. Criteria need to be fact-based. It is the only way that Europe is going to decarbonize its economy in a sustainable, man sustainable manner. 
Second, we've got to ensure a level playing field. We need to take into account the full life cycle of a technology. And we need to do that for all the technologies. This is linked to the fact that the only energy source that has no impact is the one that we do not use. And that's why an energy mix needs to be maintained. And an energy mix needs to be composed of all the low carbon solutions that we have available. The issue here is that all technologies come with both benefits and impacts, and these need to be weighed up. And by balancing our energy mix with the different technologies, we can make the most of the benefits that they have to offer and reduce any negative impacts which they may have. We need to be focusing more on the long term. Today, there's a lot of focus on reaching the 2030 targets, but we have that 2050 target of being net zero carbon. We need to take that into account. Decisions on nuclear must be taken urgently today. Why? Because it takes time to see the effects. Take a decision today, we'll only start to see them in about five to 10 years time. Also, another important point, we need to look beyond just power. Yes, nuclear is a low carbon source of electricity, but it can also support other technologies such as hydrogen, which are going to become increasingly important as we focus on decarbonizing, hard to decarbonize industries, which are going to need access to hydrogen at an affordable price 24 seven. And here maybe is a call for you because we need the Netherlands to speak up now. Once this taxonomy is adopted, it may be too late for nuclear in the EU because of the fact that it is linked to so much other policy. And once nuclear, if nuclear is not included today, we find, we believe that there is a risk that it will never be included. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, I see quite some interest from the audience in your story. So I'll pose a few questions that have been sent in, if you don't mind. Um, First of all, on the taxonomy debate that you just uh, sketched on the political side of it, the question is, what does it mean that the Germans are closing the last six plants in the next few, few years for this debate? Well, we know Germany does not support nuclear. Um, we know that there have been calls, even one this week, where Germany not only does it not want to have nuclear in its uh, in in its own country, but it also wants to try and stop nuclear elsewhere. But as some of you may be aware, uh, the closure of the nuclear power plants in Germany is not leading to a solution for the biggest issue. And what is the biggest issue? Reducing CO2 emissions. The nuclear is being replaced by renewables. So you've got low carbon replacing low carbon and coal is still succeeding. Coal plants are still being opened. We don't believe that that is good for the climate. No, uh, for sure. Um, well, staying then in CO2, um, one uh, technical question was, does this 12, um, Number of 12 for the CO2 emissions of nuclear includes also waste dispositories and um, waste disposal? My understanding is that figure includes the full life cycle. So it really is a life cycle emission assessment of nuclear, and that has come up with the figure. So my assumption is that, yes, it includes the upstream and the downstream. Yeah, I can I can confirm that it's a IPC report. Report is is indeed a life cycle assessment, so it includes the uh, the it includes the, uh, the the repositories. Yes. Um, then also on the GRC report um, research itself, do you know if there was any Dutch involvement in uh, the report itself? To my knowledge, no. Um, our understanding is that the JRC uh, was left to conduct its work on its own. Wherever they requested required information, they would reach out to, to, to the experts from whom they would require the information. I believe that, for example, in the case of the Finnish project, they did request documentation from them. But in terms of influence from uh, outside of that circle, my understanding is, is no. All right, thank you. Um... Okay, well, maybe last one, yeah. and I suggest we will, or, or we could keep uh, I will, the I will question. I'll combine the last, the last uh, two questions. Okay, right? so, good. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, well, someone is uh, questioning um, the stand of the EU committee and, and the, uh, well, he calls it sabotage of nuclear that's being conducted by this research and reviews. And his question is, is this purely green ideology or is this commercial industrial interests that are at play here? And, and then I will combine it to your um, assessment of jobs that the nuclear industry itself poses 1 million jobs in the EU, as you said. Um, so how is that in the balance? I mean, I think what we need to understand is Europe is very divided on nuclear. We have the countries uh, that really support it and the countries that are, are bringing the message that without nuclear, they simply won't be able to achieve their decarbonization targets. But we also know that there are member states that do not support nuclear and have been fighting against nuclear for a long time. And of course, that's felt within the commission services themselves. We see it at uh, commissioner level, some support, some don't. In the case of, for example, the Netherlands, I think it's known that the uh, Dutch commissioner does not support uh, nuclear. But in Indeed, you mentioned the jobs aspect. This is also something that we're trying to trying to bring across. The nuclear industry is uh, is a European industry. It has a European supply chain. We take, for example, solar panels. The majority of the solar panels today are unfortunately manufactured outside of Europe. So, whilst on the one hand, our primary goal needs to be needs to decarbonize. Uh, our economies, we also need to have an economy and to have an economy, you need jobs. And that's what we're also asking to take into account that this European supply chain plays an important role in terms of job creation and economic growth in Europe. Thank you very much. Okay, um, my microphone on, I think so. Um, thank you, Jessica, for your presentation, and we will see you again in the uh, panel discussion uh, after the last presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your uh, account. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll be going to the next presentation, and that will be of uh, Rogier Potter van Loon. Rogier, will you be, uh, if you start sharing your presentation, then I will uh, introduce you. Um, yes, at this point in the program, in the flyer, you saw the name Arnold Mulder from ABN AMRO. But unfortunately, Arnold came down with the flu yesterday. So we had the challenging task to find somebody who was willing to jump in the gaping hole with less than 40 hours to prepare. And we were very, very joyed to, uh, pleased to find Rogi Potter van Loon to save our webinar, prepare to save our webinar. Big thank you, Rogi. Rogi has contributed to Elise's white paper. So you can find his work in writing as well. Um, the white paper that we published earlier, uh, earlier this year, for which he made a societal business case for nuclear power, uh, a business case he found to be overwhelmingly positive. Uh, Rogi Potter van Loon, in his day job, works as an economist at uh, Egon. Uh, he is, uh, and it's important to mention that his presentation is given in a personal capacity. Rogi has a passion for efficiency and for optimal taxation. He, and he regularly calculates how the government could achieve an objective such as CO2 reduction, also income redistribution at the lowest possible societal costs. Ladies and gentlemen, Rogier Potter van Laan. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, guys. Am I, uh, can you hear me properly? Gijs is muted, but I think he's saying yes. So I'll uh, continue then. Uh, thanks for this uh, this introduction. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the economic approach to the climate problem. And then um, the economic point is basically, how do we reach our policy goal with minimal societal costs? Uh, another thing could be, what should be the policy goal, given the preferences of... Um, of a society, but let's not focus on that now. That's maybe a bit more political. Um, so if we have this goal, uh, this 95% CO2 reduction on the long term, how do we get it on the cheapest way? How do we get for a dubbeltje op de eerste rang? Like um, I like to think that I'm doing with my Corendon flight. I'm going to uh, Mallorca in one and a half months, hoping it's still uh, color coded yellow uh, by then which I think really fits the D Dutch uh, uh, really high quality, I think, with the all-inclusive stuff, but uh, really affordable. 
Um, so the question is, so how do you do that? And there are a couple of means. Uh, you can lower your energy demand, you can lower the CO2 intensity of that demand, or you can lower the CO2 intensity of the energy supply. I'm going to focus on the last one here now. And the method that we have as economists is really quite simple. We say, okay, we have this goal, um, and at the margin, only for the last gigawatt, gigawatt, for example, of production that we need, what are the marginal costs and benefits of each source. Now, a very simple, simplified explanation is how do I myself solve my holiday? I have a goal that is to be net zero carbon in 2021, especially just from now on. So then the question is, how do I deal with the one ton CO2 that is emitted because I'm going with Corendon to Mallorca. So I calculated that it's about one ton. Um, and there are a couple of means I can have to do that. And the first is to, I can reduce my demand by not going to Mallorca. I can change the intensity of my demand by going by train and boat instead of um, by plane. I can offset my trip. And then there's two sites for that. A really cool sites, ironically, from an anti-nuclear organization, WISE, called uh, Carbon Killer. And another site uh, called the Gold Standard, which, um, well, provides a gold standard for uh, CO2 offsets. Um, so then I look at what's the cost. Uh, so the benefits is one ton in all cases, and the cost, uh, what's the cost of all these options? Well, the first, the cost is basically infinite. Uh, my wife is a huisarts, a general practitioner. So she's been dealing with uh, Hugo de Jonge, who uh, changes the policy for her every two or three weeks. And she gets 200 calls, I think, per day uh, on uh, when the people can get the vaccine. So if you are a patient of a uh, huisarts, please don't call your huisarts. They're stressed enough already. So basically, that's not an option, infinite costs. She really needs uh, to stress out. Um, the second option is going by train and boat. That costs me about 1,200 euros extra for my family and also costs an extra day of, uh, of traveling with, uh, with two young kids. So maybe even I should have put infinite costs there because of the stress, but let's say that the immaterial costs are 600 euros. So total cost is 1800 euros here. Or I can just buy a ton of the European uh, trading emission. That's the carbon killer site that I described, which costs 47 euros currently, or you can, take the most efficient way and say, okay, we can also help uh, people in poor, pro support projects in poor countries, like uh, having more efficient cooking and heating in China. And turns out then that for just 13 euros, I can offset my, um, my one ton. So basically that's the basic concept of this, uh, of this approach. You take at the margin, you say, what are my options? How can I see it? And what is the but it's the cheapest one in this case it's the 13 euros so let's look at the marginal case for nuclear energy then and let's say whether we have this one gigawatt that we need extra production uh, uh, created so we can buy uh, as a society we could buy a reactor with one gigawatt and it costs about four billion euros now i haven't checked all these things exactly but i've been told this by the engineers who know a lot about this and they told me that for each of these numbers, I was not off by more than a level of magnitude. And they told me that that for an engineering standpoint, that that's really good. Um, so it's cost 4 billion euros, uh, takes five years to construct. And let's say that the government commits to financing this thing by giving a, linear, a mortgage with an interest rate of two and a half percent. Um, and then afterwards, all the operational and market risks, et cetera, those all lie with the provider. And this, uh, this reactor would then produce for 60 years, about eight uh, terawatt hours per year. Now there's a clear cost to society here and that lies in this financing. That's what the, what the government does. Um, and the government could get a much higher rate than the two and a half percent that it's uh, that it gets now so the cost can be calculated to be about 600 million euros um okay so that's on the one hand it's it's expensive but let's see what we get in return for that so that's the benefits and here we need to say the nice thing is with this optimization we only need to look as i said before only look at the margin so the one thing we need is there will always be some need for constant and reliable energy generation. And 
wind and solar may be great, but they're not constant and reliable. Uh, they don't always have the same uh, same production. So in this case, for this specific part that needs constant and reliable energy generation, we need to compare it to the second best alternative, which in this case currently, as we saw uh, also in the previous presentation, is gas, which is about 400 grams per uh, kilowatt hour uh, generated. So nuclear is at 12, as we saw, so you save 400 grams uh, per kilowatt hour. And if you multiply that with eight terawatt hours that you pr produce per year, you get about 3 million tons of CO2 that you reduce with a nuclear plant compared to the second best alternatives on the margin. Well, two really big numbers now. And now the question is, okay, how do we compare these two? What is the 600 million euros in the costs? And how does that compare to 3 million tons of CO2 per year? Really quite literally, uh, almost literally apples and oranges here. So for that, the crucial thing is we need, we need to look at the long term. We need to look 60 years ahead, maybe even 70, and see what is the value of a ton of CO2 in euros, not just now, but also 50 years from now. So let's make a short side step, side step and look at economics 101. If there are something called externality, so that's a cost to the society, which you don't bear as a private uh, party, and CO2 is such an example, then it's optimal to charge a tax equal to the societal cost. And once you've done that, you can just let the free market sort things out and you'll get the most efficient outcome. Um, well, this is uh, the simplest picture, in fact, that I could find about uh, the explaining this thing. And I only understand it half, so maybe don't focus on that. But the simple explanation is if you charge too little for some goods, then you will get more than you need for that. And if you charge too much, then you'll get less than you need given a social optimum. This is all how it works in theory, but the practice is usually different because we don't live in this ivory tower that we assume uh, as economists. Um, the interesting thing is in the Netherlands, we already have carbon taxes. Many people speak about introducing them, but we've had them for a while now. Uh, they're just not as clear and we give them different names. Now, the first one is in fact the European trading system, um, which is for, I think the roughly the 100 largest companies in the Netherlands. And they pay about 50 euros for every ton of CO2 that they emit. But that's not it. There's also some other taxes and we call them accents, for example. Uh, and if you look at my Skoda, uh, which is a diesel car, then I pay effectively, if you do the calculations, I pay about 1,000 euros per ton of CO2 that I emit with my car. Now, my car is, it turns out to be relatively uh, low uh, in uh, how much CO2 it produces, but in general, gasoline diesel cars cost about 400, 500 uh, euros per ton of CO2. My neighbor actually has a Tesla. I'm quite jealous of him. Um, and he gets a subsidy or he pays less taxes. Economically speaking, it's, uh, we call it the same thing. And he in fact gets 2000 euros per ton of CO2 that he emits less. And once he drives to work, uh, then it's, uh, it's quite cheap actually. Then he has to pay two euros per ton of CO2 when he charges his car. But then when he comes home and I see him charging, uh, in fact, it turns out that he pays 250 euros uh, for for the same charging, and that is because he works at a company that produces a lot of uh, that uses a lot of energy, a lot of electricity. Uh, so then, at work, he doesn't need to pay that much. Um, while at home, he has to pay a lot of so-called opslag duurzame energy, and he has to pay about 100 times more uh, at home compared to at work. You can do all these calculations also for. Uh, for solar panels, for example, then it's 150, or for onshore wind, uh, BBL has done these calculations, then it's uh, 50 euros. So for all of these, um, there are some taxes and subsidies already. And I've seen that uh, Silvio Erkens has already joined us uh, from the Dutch House of Parliament. I'd just like to say, if you take one thing home, Silvio, all you need to do is make sure that these are all the same amount. If you want the Paris Agreement, they should be about 90 euros by now. If you get all of these to exactly 90, 
then you can just chill for the next four years, don't need to do anything, the market will solve everything for you. But unfortunately, that's not the case yet. Um, now, you may think when you see this, well, what about offshore wind? Didn't I see that this is without any subsidies? Um, well, maybe legally or semantically, uh, it's, uh, it's not without subsidies, but economically speaking, any cost that the government pays that benefits a private party is considered a subsidy. And in this case, uh, the cost of having the net on the sea, so making the cables from the windmills on the sea to the shore, those are quite huge. And I think by my calculations, it costs still about 40 to 50 euros per ton of CO2. So basically we have this really high, um, high and different costs on what we pay. And we need to look at really the full picture to see, okay, what are the actual costs per ton of CO2 and where is it the cheapest? Um, so there's been some studies on this, uh, a study five years ago by CPB and PBL, which is, it's remarkable how fast things go because in five years, it's sort of already outdated. It went, uh, our transition went in fact much faster than the writers of this report uh, assumed. And they basically make a path for the next 50 years on what are the costs uh, or the other way, uh, the cost of, uh, of an extra ton or uh, sorry, the cost of reducing a ton or the other way around with the benefits if you are able to make sure that you have less, uh, um, less output of CO2. And here, this is marginal analysis where you say, okay, if we do everything efficiently, then what is exactly the price? And then we see the green line over here which basically starts at 250 already where we're currently at and really goes up. Now I've used in this analysis, I think this may be a bit high. Uh, I've used a bit a more recent paper by Van Weinberg et al to be a bit conservative. And then it starts at about 60 euros currently and slowly increases over time. And the one thing that I think we should realize and what I would like you to take home from this is that we're currently going at the low hanging fruit and the costs are now really low for CO2 or relatively low for CO2. So we're making great gains and we're seeing that and everything is in a Hosanna sphere. Um, but this will not last forever. At some point we will have captured all the low hanging fruit. For example, all the places where we're able to put onshore wind or we're able to put fields full with, uh, with solar, etc., they'll be gone. Um, and what we'll see is that the price to reduce an extra ton of CO2, so similarly the value of reducing a CO2, will slowly increase or steadily increase over time. So if you then do the calculation and see, okay, what's the marginal benefit when I, so I just have the price of these tons of CO2 that I reduce, then I see that basically in this sample case where we had, where we had a bit, bit of financing and basically as a benefit, we get the CO2 reduction. This is mostly the, the financial part. So the loan part is really trumped by the value of the CO2 reduction, the blue part here. So the total benefit is 8.1 billion euros for this hypothetical uh, one gigawatt, one gigawatt uh, reactor that goes on for 60 years of producing. And we need to compare that to only cost of 600 million euros. So from a societal perspective, this is a really good deal. You pay 600 euros and you get 8 billion euros, or you get a profit of 7.5 billion euros, or the equivalently, the societal return is 9% per year. And if you want to calculate back, see, okay, what would be the subsidy that we, um, sort of the price at which we're currently working with, that would be only five euros per ton of CO2. So currently the government is financing programs with seven euros uh, per ton of CO2, etc. cetera. Um, so what all of this shows is that if we want, uh, sorry, let me go back. If we want to reduce, uh, if we want to get to the zero, uh, zero target in 2050 and want to be at the lowest goal, uh, lowest possible cost uh, at the margin, we should at least have some nuclear reactors. Now, it doesn't mean that um, 
this has to be 100% nuclear reactors. Probably that will, will be what the next speaker will, will say. But definitely this proves that we will need some kind of nuclear because if we want to pay as little as possible, and we're Dutch, so by definition, we want to do that, uh, then basically we can always reduce a bit by using uh, a nuclear reactor instead of a gas reactor, which would be the second alternative. Guys, yeah? Uh, yeah, it's uh, a couple of minutes uh, left uh, before you, um, yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah, I'll be, yeah. I'll be, uh, I'll be quick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, question is, what about uh, biomass? Uh, we've heard a lot about that. What if you do something else? Um, well, currently, biomass uses a lot of um, uh, emits a lot of CO2. But even if you get the theoretical limit, then still, the business case is very positive. Less positive than it was previously. But but still, uh, still positive. Well, tip of slides because guys have made it quite clear what uh, was the here. Um, and basically, there's a lot of scenarios that you think of, and I've made some conservative analyses. But in all these options that we see over here, there's always a positive business case where at least we can save some money by building some nuclear capacity. And that's the main question. So if it's so great. Why aren't the companies already investing in this? Why aren't we doing this? Every company is able to build a nuclear reactor, right? That's what's all you said. And here's the difficult part. What I've just showed was a societal business case. So for society, there's the benefits, but there's all these benefits are long-term and they're all uncertain because they depend on how the government deals with the tax and subsidies. And uh, famous economic uh, thing is in the long run we're all dead. And specifically for a company in the long run, we're all at another job. So it might be nice for you, say if you're CEO of a company to invest in this, but do you only see the fits for nuclear reactor really long term, so 20, 30 years from now, at which time you'll be long gone. So the risks, short term risks are for you and the long term uh, gains are for society. So here's where the taxonomy can really help uh, to signal, hey, this is a good project. I see that at Egon, where we also need funding for our mortgages. Well, as soon as we have a label saying, okay, these mortgages are A mortgages, then it's much easier to get funding. But even more importantly, not just for the taxonomy, for the Dutch or EU government would be to give really long-term commitments, really signal making sure, okay, we're in this together, we want to do this thing because of this positive societal business case. And we can do, for example, they can take this on by taking on a large part of the financing. Um, lastly, this is my last slide, promised, guys. Um, we really need to think about the long term here. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, we've seen great declines in the cost of solar and wind over time, really extraordinary dec uh, declines, mostly because We've, uh, as a society, we've been giving subsidies to that, supporting that. Um, so even if we have uh, a small, even if there's a small probability that something like this could happen uh, for nuclear, that, it, that the cost can in fact, correct, uh, in fact uh, decrease vastly, we simply cannot risk uh, not investigating this. Um, and uh, yeah, as a last thing, France started 50 years ago with their nuclear stuff. This is where they're over here now, really at the lowest, the blue line here. So the you know, the best time to start nuclear, uh, building nuclear was 50 years ago. Uh, well, now we're thinking about the long term, so we need to think 50 years ahead. So I'm thinking the second best time to build nuclear or at least do some something with nuclear would be uh, today. Thank you, uh, Rogier. Um, see if I can switch back my camera on. Yes, I can. Uh, there seems to be some interference between my camera and your microphone, which is quite remarkable, but uh, <laughs> well, to save the show by uh, switching me off. Um, are there clarifying questions? Otherwise, we can also move quickly to the next speaker, uh, Matthijs. Um, but there is, there's room for one question. Um, well, the, the most uh, thrilling question, of course, is uh, would Egon invest? <laughs> well, 
Uh, well, for that kind of thing, uh, the taxonomy, of course, I cannot effectively say anything about Egon, blah, blah, blah. But for those kind of things, I know that we're very sensitive to these things like the taxonomy where we can say, okay, we're doing the green thing. Um, so yeah, that would make a huge difference. Very clear answer, thank you. Uh, thanks again for your presentation and we will also see you uh, in the panel discussion uh, afterwards. So, um, I'm uh, Matthijs, can you uh, start your presentation and in the meanwhile I will introduce you. Um, I think it was in 2014 14, that I spotted Matthijs Beckers on the internet for the first time. But it may also have been as early as 2013. Matthijs was as passionate about clean energy and about the need to do your math properly as I was. But while I was focusing on trying to assess the reality of modern salt reactor development, Matthijs was asking hard questions about materials use of energy systems. Earlier than anyone else I know, he became aware of the severe materials, limita materials limitations that were looming in case humanity should one day become serious about building sufficient amounts of machinery to harvest renewable energies. Uh, the other day, in our national on our national radio, I heard Ed Naples, who leads our national climate program, has recently been made aware of these materials limitations for the first time. Well, better late than never, but Matthijs was a couple of years earlier. I know only one person who can zap all over the place on Google Earth and dive into mining sites, the one mining site after the other, confronting you with the harsh reality of the materials aspect. As an example, tonight, Tonight, Matthijs is going to talk about just one of these essential metals, copper. How much do we need? How much are we going to need? And how fast can we get it out of the ground? And what difference does it make if we include nuclear, if we look at it from the materials perspective? Ladies and gentlemen, Matthijs Beckers. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction, Gijs. Well, right here, there's a little, uh, little introduction on the screen. As you can see, I wrote four books. I created two documentaries and I have been uh, engaged with um, basic, basically explaining why we need nuclear. And I've been doing this, like I said, since 2012 about, and we met in 2013. So as you can see, uh, I like to take my mind off things. So Star Wars is my getaway because sometimes, you know, it just becomes overwhelming to see what we are doing to the planet. So um, why excluding nuclear from the taxonomy is unreasonable and we are already hitting limits. So I want to preface this with, uh, with the fact that we do need renewables, but it is unreasonable to exclude nuclear energy. So let's, let's, let's look at the problem from a very simple perspective. On the left-hand side, you see a house uh, in the winter and the people, they look at their electricity bill and they see that they have used up three and a half thousand kilowatt hours this year. And uh, well, if you, if you look at it from a, from, a, from a personal perspective and you look at your electricity bill and you think, okay, let, let's slap like, you know, 20 PV panels on our roof and then our electricity problem is solved. If you, if you expand towards, for instance, the Dutch perspective, the, from, from the perspective of an entire country, then you can see that three and a half thousand kilowatt hours is nothing and that we use, you know, almost, almost a thousand times as much. So it's in, it, it, the problem is incredible. I said incredible. If you look at it from a planetary perspective, it even becomes much, much, much bigger. So let's get back to the Netherlands. We just zoomed out too quickly. Uh, we want to see, you know, uh, what is going on. The Netherlands is a quite energy intensive uh, country. We use, you know, we are in the top 10 of energy usage per capita, which means not just electricity, but also all the services that are available to us, building materials, the stuff you buy in, in the shops, you name it. So TNO, which is basically a research institute that does research for the government, has built a transform model. And this transform model is there to show uh, basically politicians, government people, but also regular Joes like you and me, um, 
what we could do in order to become, you know, carbon neutral. Um, so in essence, if we look at their, their, their transform model, they, they basically say, okay, by 2050, 71% of all our energy, not, not just electricity, energy will come from wind on sea, wind on land and PV. And PV is photovoltaics, solar power. Now, the good news is that 10 gigawatts will become from onshore wind. But the bad news is that they want us to build 90 gigawatts of PV, solar PV, and almost 60 gigawatts of offshore wind. Now, if we turn this around and we make this a 100% renewable strategy, 100% of our energy comes from, from, uh, from, from wind and solar, then we need to build 221 gigawatts of wind and solar. And, and if you look at what we have today, we have about 30 gigawatts, and that's coal, oil, gas, nuclear, wind, solar, and a smidgen of hydro. So this is a lot. This is, this is much, 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 much more than we have today. So um, you see this beautiful picture. This elephant is clearly not in the room, but we do have an elephant in the room. And that's uh, uh, nuclear, uh, because nuclear has been excluded uh, at the climate tables, the climate talks. Uh, and that's, that was a really, really unfortunate decision. So if you look at the material requirements for wind, solar, and nuclear in tons per terawatt hour, so basically what we're looking here is at efficiency. How efficient is a certain uh, energy source in uh, um, basically putting materials to good work? These materials are not consumed, but you need them. You need to tie them up in electricity production. So they're lost for the time being. Now, you can see that nuclear, it doesn't even reach 20 tons per terawatt hour. PV is the worst, almost 160, terawatt, 160 tons per terawatt hour. Onshore wind is slightly better than offshore wind. And that's because of the, the uh, that, that's, that's because of the difference in, um, in, 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 as you can see, zinc usage. Now, um, this this picture alone doesn't doesn't tell us everything. So let's let's look at let's look at the TNO uh, transform model, and instead of uh, doing what they did, you know what we are going to do is we take the seventy one percent, and then we are going to add nuclear first, and then see how much we can you know how much materials we can save. So by including 30 gigawatts of nuclear, which is a large number, but it's not less large than offshore wind or PV, um, we can spare four gigawatts of onshore wind, which means a lot of you know, headaches because many people are up in arms against onshore wind, and 41 gigawatts of solar. Now, why 41 gigawatts of solar? That's because... And I've used the capacity factor of 20%, which is much higher than is actually achieved in the Netherlands. So I'm giving, I gi I'm giving solar the benefit of the doubt here. Um, that's because it's very inefficient. And especially in a country like the Netherlands, which is quite a ways up from the equator, which has a lot of uh, cloud coverage, rain, you name it. So solar is not that, that efficient. But, you know, we are still building a, a lot of energy in our infrastructure, but it's a lot less. It's, it's 90 gigawatts less than you would have using just onshore wind, just offshore wind and PV. Now, if you look at the critical material usage of the nuclear scenario versus the non-nuclear scenario, then you can see a stark difference. So this is the, the, this is the scenario that I just showed you. Uh, let's see previous this scenario. And the other scenario is the one that you saw in the first page. It's just the TNO transform model, but then extrapolated to 100%. So these two scenarios generate the same amount of electricity in a year, but the nuclear scenario does it with 
800,000 tons of critical materials less. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm specifically saying critical materials because this does not include concrete, this does not include aluminium, steel, plastic, a glass, because otherwise you would see an even bigger difference. So this is not the entire picture, but I'm not going to give you the entire picture because I want to concentrate on copper today. So if I extrapolate Tino's transform model towards the planet, so we're going to do the entire planet the Dutch way, we're going to give we're going to create an equitable energy system for all human beings on the planet, which means that we divide the number, which which means that we divide, we, we create a, 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 a we we create a, a model that is basically seventeen, you know, dividing the energy by seventeen million, and then, um, and, and then multiplying that with nine point seven billion. So that's what you see right here. So this is copper. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to uh, focus on copper. So we need uh, 50 gigawatts of uh, 50,000 gigawatts of offshore wind, nearly nine gigawatt nine nine thousand gigawatts of onshore wind, and almost eighty thousand gigawatts of PV. So in all, if you if you add this up, this is this is more than hundred terawatts basically. Now, if you if you if you multiply this by the copper usage that we used just now, and we look at the 2020 production, the 2020 production of copper was 25 million tons. Now, if you look at if you if you take the 20 the 2050 situation and you can't calculate back and you do it in a linear fashion, which means that you're going to add it, add the same amount of renewables each year until 2050 then you're going to need another 22.5 million tons of copper each year. Now, some people would bring their hands and say, okay, there's no problem. We, we, we produce two and a half million tons more than we need, right? But the problem is, this is already a highly volatile market. There's a lot of commodities being traded because, you know, we use all that copper. So we need to, we need to, we need to excavate an additional amount of copper in order to get our energy transition done. So that, that's le that leaves us with almost twice the amount of copper that we need to unearth. And this is something that has never happened before. We have never, 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 ever um, uh, doubled our, our copper production in a time of, you know, not, not even in 10 years, has never, ever happened. And if we build this 100% this renewable world, we are going to need 1.4 billion tons of copper. And there's only 870 uh, uh, million tons of copper that we can unearth economically right now. So we're already punching through, uh, uh, you know, whatever, whatever seems to be reasonable right now. Obviously, no reserves can stretch, you know, if, if, if we, we need to dig up more, and the prices go up, that means that the known reserves go up. So this is not to say that this is impossible. This is just to say that it's highly improbable. So just, just the news that I read today, shortages, shortages flagged for EV materials, lithium and cobalt. Now, I was talking about copper earlier, but lithium and cobalt, they, are, they, they have a similar perspective as, as, as copper has. And 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 just look at just look at the headline and and and, and the subtext. Lithium prices have doubled since November. Copper uh, cobalt occurs as a byproduct, complicating investment decisions. And nickel is on the verge of a super cycle. Uh, it, it is hype, Macquarie says. So next up, and this is something that I got from Bright New World, which is an Australian uh, NGO, uh, also uh, looking into the same things. What you see here is basically um, the the time it takes to discover a mine and get a permit and start operating it. Now, this is the, the last column that you see here. So if we look at copper, for instance, then you see that the average delay 
is 16.8 years. So if the, the demand for copper rises right now and, and there's insufficient mines, and I promise you there are insufficient mines at this moment, at this moment, it's going to take 16.8 years before copper production can actually catch up to the level that it is required to be. So this is good news for if you're in copper, because this means that, you know, copper prices will skyrocket and, and stay high, but also you can, you can see the conversion rate. So, so if you, if you discover 950 deposits and you only developed 353 and the same can be said for, for instance, the contained metal. So, so you have 200 and uh, so this is a megatons of copper, right? And you see that in total, you have this amount and, 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 and then develop to get that, which means that the larger deposits get, get, get converted into mines and it takes 16.8 years. This tells us that we were in tremendous trouble. We are already in tremendous trouble. I just showed you that nuclear is a materials, uh, you, you could basically see it as a way to mitigate the use of critical materials. The more nuclear you use, the less critical materials you use. And that's why we need to add nuclear to the mix because we are, we are, we are sleepwalking into a, a problem of epic magnitude. So, and, and, and then finally, just to, to make a bridge to the do no, do no serious harm principle of the EU taxonomy, which is, I, I think it's, it's a, really, it's, it's a secondary uh, consideration because I think that the, the commodity side of the problem is much, much, much larger than the radioactive waste part of nuclear power. As you can see, this is a picture of me standing right next to a, a, a dry cask of low level radioactive waste. I've all, also stood on top of, a, of a, a, a storage container for a high level nuclear waste. Um, I, I think this is, this is, I mean, this is just not, not a big problem. Um, you really need to visit COVRA to, to, to understand how we store this stuff, what it does. Um, compared to the copper crisis that is looming, storing nuclear, nuclear waste is something that we have done for ages and ages and ages. So this, this brings me to the conclusion, the do no serious harm thing is not something that I worry about that much. Well, I do worry about the way that it is being handled. Luckily, the JRC has says, well, it does not do any serious harm. Uh, but to me, the copper, the, the copper issue and the materials usage issue is much, much, much more important. You could also, uh, it's analogous to the, to the land usage as well. You can put a nuclear power plant on, on, on a piece of land the size of a football field, maybe two football fields. And if you want to create energy using wind or solar, uh, the equivalent amount of energy creation, you would need, you know, many square kilometers to achieve the same end. And, and that's why we need to absolutely add nuclear to the EU taxonomy and why we need to work on nuclear in the Netherlands. So this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Matthijs. Um... Walter, is there are there clarifying questions? Uh, uh, two important questions uh, have been asked. Uh, Matthijs, um, could you say uh, in your numbers, do you also include the grid capacity expansion that might be needed for including no. renewables and storage backup needs? No, your no, that's that's that that's the that's the hard part to model because that's not even in there. So in fact, if, if I would do that, it would even make the case for nuclear even better. But I don't do it because there's too many question marks at this moment. I can do it, but that would paint an even even grimmer picture, and I, I don't want to make people. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to give them bad feelings. <laughs> well, and then uh, another um, challenging question. Um, you saw the benefit of using uh, nuclear because, well, materials are scarce, and we excavate a lot on our precious planet. Um, in the conclusion, somebody says, 
um, why can't, what, what is that the renewables can contribute that nuclear cannot? So why should we go to any use of materials for renewables? Yeah, the, 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 trouble, the trouble is that we don't have the acceptance needed to do that. So from a purely technocratic perspective, I would say, you know, I, I would be practical about it. We, we should use solar on, on, on homes and we should use, uh, I'm, I'm a particular fan of, of, of solar heating, uh, wind, not so much, but, but here's the thing. It's just not, it, it, we could potentially practically do it, but it's not, it, it, if you look from a socioeconomic perspective, it's just not going to happen. So we have to be realistic about it. And that's what I'm, so that's what I try to do with these, with these uh, presentations. I try to carve out a new niche for nuclear to reestablish itself. And in the end, maybe we will end up saying, okay, in 20 or 30 years from now, uh, yes, nuclear indeed is the best bet. But if you look at it from a societal perspective right now, people are simply not ready to accept that premise. And as long as we keep developing wind and solar, and as long as they help uh, uh, putting a dent in the carbon problem, which we have today, uh, uh, I'm going to support that. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to invite our uh, uh, all the panel members now to uh, switch on their cameras and microphones. Um, and uh, while you do, I um, see who see who you, see who we have here. Uh, it's, uh, I thought Jan Huytema was with us already uh, as well. Isn't that true? I didn't yeah. see him. <laughs> ah, I think it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, very good. Um, yeah, I've, I've introduced the, uh, the speakers, uh, the presenters, uh, so I want to quickly introduce uh, uh, our, uh, uh, Silvio and uh, Jan Huytema as well, so everybody knows uh, who we have here. Um, Silvia, I'll start with you. Uh, Silvia Eckert was born uh, August 1990, uh, so now at the age of 30, uh, he is, he should, I think he will be one of the younger politicians in our House of Representatives. In recent elections, he was 18th place uh, in, on the list of the VVD, the Dutch Liberal and largest and our largest party. He received more than 4,000 preference votes and was sworn as a member to the House of Representatives on March 31 this year. And in his portfolio presently, he has the important subject of climate and energy policy. Now, earlier this month, uh, he gave his calling card by filing a motion on Europe's sustainable taxonomy. The thrust of the motion was clear, Dutch government, please make a case for Euro, uh, in Europe for the inclusion of nuclear energy in Europe's sustainable taxonomy. And he won, the motion was passed. That was wonderful, Silvio, another big thank you for that. And last night, uh, Silvio uh, clearly and calmly explained and defended his position on nuclear energy in a webinar for an audience that was not immediately unanimously convinced that technology neutrality means that nuclear energy should be given an equal opportunity to other CO2 free sources. I'm putting it politely, I think. Um, Silvio, when did you begin to suspect that ignoring nuclear energy does not necessarily help climate policy? Well, I think, thanks for the introduction, guys. I think um, it happens as soon as you start reading about climate change and uh, you just get some information to you. I mean, quite frankly, I have the feeling that, uh, and that's also why it's important that the VVD becomes very active on climate and energy policy, that if you leave it up to activists who've sworn off nuclear energy from the start for ideological reasons, then you won't solve the climate problem we have. I mean, the immediate steps we have um, in terms of, of CO2 reduction, yes, you can focus on solar and wind, but if you look further into the future, you can just see that you need something at the base loads um, and nuclear energy is that best option. And that's also why we, uh, why we focus on it from the CVD's perspective, because without it, I don't think we will be able to become CO2 neutral as an add-ons. Thank you. Uh, my next introduction is uh, for Jan Huytema. 
Uh, Jan Hetema has been a member of uh, European Parliament since 2014. And after the election in uh, spring 2019, Hetema was re-elected uh, with uh, 115,000 preferential votes. In his second and current mandate, Hetema is again active in the Committee on Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, uh, ENVI in short, uh, and, for, uh, and also for the Agriculture Committee. Hetema is also part of Renew Europe. Born as the son of a dairy farmer, not only agriculture, but also the environment has his warm attention. And he currently has also secularity in his portfolio. Now, Hertzma made a big impression on me personally because he was the first European politician who appeared to see through the anti-nuclear game that was played at, by the NV committee around Christmas 2019. The climax of this game will revolve around whether or not nuclear energy should be included in the EU's sustainable taxonomy. Um, interestingly enough, this uh, powerful uh, NV committee, uh, of which, as I said, Jan Hertema is a member, is chaired by a former president of French section of the World Wildlife Fund, Pascal Canfin, the personal epicenter of anti-nuclear action in the European Parliament. Um, Jan Hertema, the message that excluding nuclear energy is not in the interest of nature and the environment seems difficult to get through to traditional environmental activists. Do you see any progress in that area? Yes, well, first of all, you're absolutely right. Eh? There are even some political groups that are uh, funded or raised because of that position. So, for example, the Greens in the European Parliament, uh, that was more or less, that's the German Greens, and they had only one uh, yeah, issue. It was a one issue party back in the 80s, and that was Atomkraft Nein Danke. And that was the, their whole history. For them, it's very difficult, of course, then to vote in favor of this. Uh, one example, uh, you did not refer on that, but it was also in the same year, in 2019, we had a resolution on the Green Deal. I successfully, with other colleagues, put in an amendment that was adopted to include also nuclear. The Greens could not vote in favor of a resolution on the Green Deal because of that amendment. So. The Greens that really wanted to have a Green Deal eh, to be also climate neutral in 2050 had to vote in the end on minus because of nuclear. And this is so typical, I think, also in a discussion that it's much more about gut feeling than it's just about science. And you see, I think, more and more that science, and hopefully will, will prevail. Also, the JRC JRC study is very clear in that. So I really hope that also in taxonomy, it's now delayed, also because of political reasons, it's September, October or November will come out and it will be included. And I think that would be a great step. And um, I think like Sofrio is, is saying, we don't have the luxury to exclude those techniques. It's so incredible difficult to be climate neutral in 2050 and nuclear is a very valid option to do so. One example that strikes me the most a lot of people are saying wind and solar is the solution. Um, but for example, in Germany, um, the difference between the solar power, the solar total solar energy in summer and in winter is nine fold, nine times. So if you would like to produce as much as solar power in the winter than in summer, you need nine times as much solar panels uh, that there is in Germany now. So. That's huge. It's it's so difficult to, to uh, uh, fulfill the energy mix only with solar and, uh, and wind. Yeah, right. Well, uh, uh, Matthias and, and you, I think Silvio as well, are referring to one uh, very crucial point, and that that's the your know, ideas about or every uh, ideas about uh, the what the way forward could be in this conversation about nuclear. And I think we will definitely come back to that uh, later on in discussion. This discussion. Um, thank you both of you, all of you, for being with her, uh, with us here uh, to, tonight. Um, Jessica, I was just curious. Uh, Foratom has been closely following the process of the European Commission Scientific Bureau's report on nuclear en energy. Uh, can you uh, update us on where this process is right now? So, uh, with regards to the, the JRC report, you mean? Huh? Yes. Yes. So, as I said, so the JRC report has been made public. Um, where we are now is these two expert groups. 
the two expert groups we understand have adopted their opinions. They were adopted uh, this week and we believe that they could be made public uh, tomorrow. We're not certain on this because we have received different bits of information uh, as some saying yes they will render them public, some saying no they may not render them public. Um, once we have those two opinions, it will then be up to the Commission to take a decision on whether to add nuclear to this so-called Complementary Delegated Act. And as I said, this is where politics really comes in. Um, because of the information that we're hearing that even if the scientists confirm that nuclear is sustainable, the politicians may decide to still exclude it from the taxonomy. So that remains a very, very real risk. Right. As to when we'll have a clear idea on what they will do, we think it's probably going to be after the summer, but that complementary delegated act, it may not come out until the end of the year, once the parliament has already voted on the delegated act or rejected the delegated act presented in June. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Jan, because you're you are our, uh, a member of Parliament in in Europe. Um, uh, what what do you what have you seen happening around uh, the GRC report uh, in the uh, European Parliament? Well, I think the previous speaker is completely right. There is uh, a political discussion uh, about this, but this is just about political reasons, so to say, and not so much about scientific reasons. So that's also what strikes me the most that we don't have a discussion really on the content itself. It's more about gut feeling and emotions. And uh, I knew that in 2014, when I was elected, that this is the case. But it, uh, when you're in the middle of it, in it, uh, it still strikes me. So it's very unclear what it will do. It will be, um, I think, a very slim majority in favor or, or against. And indeed, we have to wait um, yeah, not after the summer for that extra delegated act on that. And indeed, the European Parliament has a veto, uh, so to say. They could indeed uh, vote it down. And if you would like to give me an estimate, I really don't know. I really don't know. Right. Uh, Silvio, have you, uh, uh, what, what, is, what is the status of the GRC report in the, in the Dutch politics? Are, are people... Well, actually, two questions. One is, is are people aware of uh, uh, this uh, GRC report and, and about its implications in the Dutch politics? I mean, to, to answer that question, guys, I think people are aware. I think it's also quite the known fact that nuclear energy does not emit CO2, as already had been proven. Um, I think people just decide for political reasons they're still opposed to it, and they decide to ignore the effort. I think it's exactly the same as Jan said. It's a bit disappointing, but that's unfortunately also the way politics works in this case. Right. And 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 uh, about your uh, taxonomy uh, motion, no. um, uh, how what what response have you give, uh, have you got uh, to that? I mean, uh, have people supported your? Uh, do anti-nuclear parties come to you and say, "Well, this is an incredibly bad idea"? How how does this work? Um, it's quite interesting. So basically, just to, to elaborate a bit on it, um, I saw that in Europe, France, together with multiple other smaller countries, uh, sent a letter to the European Commission to make sure that we would follow science and have a technology neutral taxonomy. Uh, the Netherlands did not sign that letter, which surprised me to a large extent, because we've never excluded nuclear energy from our own energy mix. Uh, so I decided to do some digging and uh, also talk a bit with our colleagues in Europe um, to figure out that indeed there is a political game ongoing behind the screens. And I do think it would make a lot of sense. It would really strengthen the case for nuclear if the Netherlands would also sign up to these kind of initiatives because you have France. I mean, it's a, it's a big state. They have a lot of influence. Um, and there are seven smaller states who signed the letter. But the Netherlands is also seen as quite a respectable member of the European Union. And if, that would, if the Netherlands would band together with France on this, I think it would really strengthen the case. Uh, it would help in the dynamic. I don't know if it would make a difference fully. Uh, but so far, we've gotten very positive responses in the Netherlands, at least, especially from, uh, well, mostly uh, from Liberale Vriende and uh, our VVD members as well. Um, I think everyone knows that we need to make a few steps on this. People are a bit worried that indeed for political reasons, we're going to exclude nuclear energy. And people also understand what, the, com what, what the, the consequences are of that, right? If we don't have nuclear energy in our future energy mix, I think Matthijs mentioned in his presentation, we will need a lot more renewables 
on land as well, because we need all the space we can get. That's not something people prefer, in the Netherlands at least. And in addition to that, we'll also become very dependent on import again of energy from different markets. And I think only with nuclear can we prevent those yeah, two problems from becoming even bigger to a large extent. Right. Uh, Jessica, I'm curious about what you said about uh, uh, the, how, um, uh, your, your, well, what you expressed was that the Netherlands could make really uh, make a, an important difference in uh, this uh, in this uh, in this file for uh, for Europe and for the inclusion in the taxonomy. Um, we're a small country. Why 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 would we make a difference? Well, there's two there's two places where the the Netherlands can make a difference. First of all, as we've just been discussing in the European Parliament, the more MEPs who are willing to consider potentially rejecting the Delegated Act that's currently on the table because of the uncertainty around this complementary Delegated Act, the greater the chance that it will be rejected. And in Parliament, in order to achieve that rejection, it's just a simple majority. So they just need uh, just one vote over half to reject it. But there's also the council, which has an important role to play. There it's a bit more difficult because a rejection in the council would require 65% of member states to reject the delegated act. So we're going beyond half, which can prove challenging. But of course, the Netherlands here again has the possibility to vote in council and its vote counts. So the more member states that decide we don't agree with the process and therefore we are going to reject it, the greater the chance that the delegated act would fall. Now to say, I mean, obviously for us as far as I do want to make one thing clear, we, we never support, um, we're not in favor of going against legislation. We always uh, want to call for, I would say dialogue and trying to find legislation that's got, or coming up with legislation that is going to work. Unfortunately in this case, as I keep saying, because they've not adopted a scientific approach to the taxonomy, we just don't believe that the legislation that's in place is going to achieve the goal that it wants to achieve. And that's why we think serious consideration needs to be given to rejecting this delegated act. And that's why we're asking countries like the Netherlands to, to at least consider this option. I'm curious about uh, 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 Rogier. Um... As you, you have been listening as an economist as well to, uh, to uh, Jessica's recount on the, yeah, the different finance constructions uh, the, that are relevant to, the fi well, to financing nuclear as well. Uh, is there anything that struck you in uh, Jessica's presentation about that aspect? No, I th so I think the economics are quite clear, but the nice thing, and there's... Um... So what's happening here is, uh, is is clearly just politics, and that's also, um, yeah, ironically, there's also a section of economics on political economics, and that's basically uh, describes how well many politicians have, uh, say, a four-year cycle, and if you have a four-year cycle, maybe that can explain why you are also such a short have such a short-term focus. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, unless we're able to uh, maybe change the laws and enforce uh, that politicians have a 30-year cycle or something. Um, I'm afraid that this political influence, uh, this short-term, uh, this forced short-term uh, political influence will, uh, yeah, will be with us for a while. Um, switch to uh, Matthijs. Um... Uh, I, I, there, there was something in your presentation as well uh, about especially this long, longer term focus. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, you, what you have been describing is sort of a unique situation in history, maybe, uh, that we really have a planned worldwide operation to switch to a different technology. Uh, you have may have been giving this a lot of thought, but but uh, what what are what are the signs that we could uh, yeah uh, registrate that we are really running into these limits? You said something about it, but what are your thoughts on that? You know, well, if if you look at the adoption of renewables, then in a, in a sense it's good. It's it's not bad that we are adopting renewables, and it's not even bad that we are adopting renewables at a large scale. But it, it becomes troublesome once people don't don't understand that what they are doing is they're basically denuding massive tracts of land 
for for resources and they're not taking into consideration any 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 form of optimization you know resource use optimization and the trouble is exactly as 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 was said by 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 Jessica and by Rogier that the four year cycle um basically some people some people don't see beyond the scope of the four years but this problem it, you know these resource constraints are already uh, are already here and and so in some situations the situation is even becoming untenable look for instance at the silicon shortage in in you know for the chips um just 10 kilometers from here there's a large car manufacturing facility where they create the mini car and they have stopped producing cars for two weeks because they didn't have any chips to put in their cars. Now, with copper, we have been lucky because we are rich enough to simply buy the copper at nearly any price. But at, at, at one point, this is also becoming a problem because more and more countries that have you know resource-intensive economies like China, they are basically going to stockpile as much copper as they can and they're going to outbid us. And, and, and this will end up, you know, creating shortages all across the board. And, and, and that's just not a good, good issue. And this is something that uh, politicians don't see happening. Economists, they, they will probably see it happening, but it's, it, it, it's a very, it's a very, very uh, precarious situation that we're moving into. I'm uh, buying copper shares after your presentation, <laughs> <laughs> Um I see, <clears throat> sorry, I see we have a, a, a surprise guest. Uh, is this Kalev Kalamet um, that is present here on the Kalev? And yeah, he, yeah, yeah, I correct. I suspected something of the kind. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I wanted to comment on, um, if you may, um, yeah, maybe, 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 horizon. maybe, you should, maybe, maybe I should, uh, I should briefly introduce you, or you want to? Did you, well, uh, very shortly, uh, Kalev Kalemets is, uh, uh, is 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 uh, the initiator of uh, Fermi Energia, and uh, Fermi Energia is uh, interested in uh, building uh, small modular reactors in Estonia, and uh, also in uh, the Netherlands, probably. Am I saying too much? Yeah, a little bit, but uh, but uh, I wanted to comment on the time horizon, and uh, from uh, both Estonian and Finnish perspective. And there are some people that have a longer term, uh, uh, how to say, horizon, and th these people are called entrepreneurs, and uh, um, and uh, and also they, they are called capitalists. Uh, th they are the people that have. Uh, business interest in uh, manufacturing that is uh, either uh, capital intense or they do have a vested interest that uh, the economy of a special uh, particular nation does well. That has been uh, the overriding reason why Finnish uh, industrialists have been investing into, into nuclear in, uh, in Finland. And this is the overriding reason why we have had uh, success in Estonia in raising capital uh, into into our uh, venture of uh, indeed deploying uh, nuclear in Estonia, and if you look at the story of Tesla, it is not the reason that uh, its PE is seven, is seven and it would be making uh, earnings that are um, uh, how to say commensurate or uh, commensurate uh, to its uh, earnings right now. But um, if you are able to recognize fundamental trends and you're able to uh, explain those fundamental ten trends to um, large enough population and, and explain to them that uh, it is uh, something that is going to happen. If you're able to do that, then, then you're able to accumulate a sufficient amount of capital to change realities. Um, I might say that in small scale, we have done so in, in Estonia. So we have raised capital from 1,300 uh, individuals in Estonia. 
and this from Estonian perspective and uh, scale it is well 0.1 percent of population <laughs> so <laughs> it's not so 0.01 so it's uh, it's but still it's quite enough so it it is possible to change the, the time horizon equation if you focus on the right population that that's what i'm saying yeah, Politicians are not the right, per but if you're able to change the capitalist perception, then you're able to change the uh, politicians' perceptions. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, no, no, no it, 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 well, you mentioned a very important thing, I think, and it's, it's called the world bird uh, vision. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about this, uh, and, and that maybe uh, I would like to hear it from both, from Jan Huytema and from uh, Silvio. Um, with the transition as it's going now, uh, we as Europe are making ourselves quite dependent from, uh, well, different sources of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, especially uh, gas. Uh, there will, we will be going to need uh, lots of uh, gas from, uh, from, from Russia, for instance. We are also going to need lots of materials from the Chinese. What has happened to uh, 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 yeah good good old vision strategic vision for independence uh, like uh, for long term ind independence uh, or or at least a, a, a healthy degree of uh, possible independence uh, for the European Union and for the Netherlands? Uh, Jan, Jan, would you like to respond to that? Well, the, the the answer is simple. What they are all saying, we have to have renewables. But we all agree, I think, in this call that that is not sufficient. But that is just the political discussion that we have in the European Parliament, and that's yeah, difficult to the overcome. Point, the point is, the point is that there's that there, when you focus on one thing, you sometimes tend to forget other important areas. And so you say, so, okay, you we we want renewables. Yeah, that's what that's what Europe says. But yeah, well, that means no, that we are going not, to buy not. lots of materials from China and lots of gas from Russia. No, but that's what I'm saying. That is the political discussion here. So if you ask people that are against nuclear, and then you say, indeed, how do you want to be independent to third countries? The answer is always renewables. And that is what I'm saying. I don't feel, I don't believe, and that is also what uh, the, the people that are presenting their presentations, present, presentations, it's a little bit wishful thinking. I think it's very, very difficult to fulfill that only with renewables. And I do believe, like Sylvia was saying, that we need an, another technique like indeed uh, a nuclear or nuclear fusion or, or whatsoever. And I think it's also a little bit unfair that they are now saying, and I'm now referring a little bit to Franz Timmermans here, he's always saying, yeah, it's not economic, there's no business plan. Or we should have started early because 2030 is too late. Yeah, <laughs> but the last 20 years, nuclear was such a dogma, it was such a negative uh, atmosphere there, that there was no possibility to start there because there was no political support. And now to say eh, so much years later that it's too late, I think it's quite unfair. Right. And um, uh, well, maybe a, a, a similar question to, uh, to, uh, to Silvio. Um, is, is there a, a, a vision within the VVD uh, about the, yeah, about about a uh, balanced mix of, uh, of 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 energy sources, um, and also that the that the VVD is really uh, uh, putting her weight uh, behind it, and not use it in the uh, coalition uh, negotiations, for instance. I mean, there is definitely a vision from our side on the energy mix. Also, to answer your previous question that that you said to Jan, that I deemed quite interesting. Um, about independence when it comes to energy. I mean, quite frankly, for the Netherlands at least, we will not become energy independent. It's it's not possible in the coming 20, 30 years. So just be realistic. I think the secret for us will be in diversification. And that's why we said we need to focus on multiple tracks. Um, we have the North Sea, we can build wind farms in there. We have solar energy, but indeed, like you said, guys, we also need the materials for that. So we are dependent from specific markets on it. We have carbon capture for now uh, as a technique we could also use in gas centers in the future. We have hydrogen power. We could also create with nuclear power and we have nuclear power. And all those different power sources have different markets we can source them from. So the more we diversify that on top of like at least a base load of national production and adequate national reserves of the resources you need for that, I think that will be the best position the Netherlands can take in this case. Because I do not believe that we can become energy independent. We're a tiny country 
we barely have any land. We need to import a lot of things, including the materials for the nuclear power plants. Um, but at the same time, we're also a trading nation. So I feel if we diversify it across markets, we don't become dependent on one country. I feel the risk can be managed. Uh, what I want to prevent is that we indeed pick one energy source and we become dependent of one country. And that's a bit what we've seen in some European countries now when it comes to gas, for example, and pipelines to Russia. It makes you extremely dependent. And we should really start preventing that in the future because I think at least the VVD, I also think in the European Parliament, I doubt they think differently about it. We've woken up. We live in a less friendly and uh, less liberal democratic world, I would say. We should also um, you know, start to act like it. Very good. Uh, Walter, I think uh, there are some questions from the audience as well to the panelists. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And connecting to the latest uh, topic on dependency, maybe Jan can uh, answer. Um, the question is, Aren't you afraid that if we include nuclear, that we might be dependent on Iranian mining countries? Well, I think indeed, eh, to be completely independent in everything, that's, I think, a utopia. Uh, I think that's not, not reasonable. However, uh, we do, we can see the, 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 how you say, the, the potential there is to be much more independent than we are now, that we are now. Uh, indeed, that's about energy, but I think an important aspect that I do feel that it's sometimes overlooked is circularity and also circularity in nuclear and nuclear energy. So we are talking a lot about waste and nuclear waste, but I'm not an, I'm not an expert, but I've heard that the, the fuel cells that we are now using, we only using maybe up to five or 10 percent and there is still 90 percent of energy left in the fuel cells that we are not using, cannot use anymore with new techniques, with maybe an, a reactor number uh, version four, or maybe even uh, with newer in innovation, we can, uh, 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 how you say, uh, get, get more energy of, of, the, of the materials of the fuel, fuel pots that we have having now. And that no it's not only applying for nuclear, but it's about, it's, it applies to batteries, it applies to so many other things. So I do believe that circularity is a very, very important aspect. I do believe if we don't have circularity high on the agenda, that absolutely we will not uh, uh, reach the, the targets of the Green Deal. It's super important. And also, I do believe it's economically a very wise decision to focus on that uh, because the European Union and especially the Netherlands is very competitive in knowledge and innovation. And we are not so much competitive in primary resources and, and low lay and uh, low cost labor, for example. So I think even if we want to remain a global competitor uh, for the long future, we should really upscale uh, towards a much more circular economy. And we are luckily uh, very busy in the European Union to come forward with new proposals uh, in order to achieve this. And especially the whole thing is indeed again about cost. How can we have a level playing field between Primary, primary raw materials and secondary uh, materials. I think that is key. Uh, Matthijs, can you say something shortly about uh, uh, recycling uh, nuclear uh, fuel? Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting topic. I mean, the, the nuclear waste issue can, can, be, can be divided up into, into several different solutions. Uh, one of which, which is perfect, perfectly reasonable, is is you get the one true cycle, which means that you you use your nuclear fuel, it comes out of the nuclear reactor, and then you store it until you can put it into the ground. Basically, um, the second thing that we can do is 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 extract all the uranium and the plutonium, and that is this is something which we are doing right now, which is basically the first form of recycling in nuclear. You create MOX fuel. You, you, you get the fuel back from France because this process is being done in France and, and the rest that you get back, which is vitrified, it's basically cast in glass. You, you, you then store somewhere safe and, 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 and then after, you know, 50 or 60 years, you find a repository for it. You babysit it for, for a while and then it's basically harmless. Now, the, 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 the most ideal situation is when you get a fast reactor. A fast reactor can use almost anything that can split. Um, so if you put uranium-238 in there, it creates plutonium, which sounds scary. 
but the plutonium is subsequently used as a fuel. So, so, so you get much more fuel utilization out of your uranium because currently we only use the uranium-235, which is in the fuel, and that's only 4% of the total fuel that it's in there. So there's there's loads of potential. And in essence, if you look at this process, which is which is already being done in other countries, and we have we have scientific proof that it's possible, uh, this means that we have virtually endless supplies of uranium for nuclear energy. Okay. Um, I see I see we are already going to the end of the, the webinar. I, I, I understand that Rogier has a question for Jan Huytema. Is that correct, uh, Rogier? Uh, no, I do not. I would just oh, like to okay. add that uh, <laughs> from an economic perspective, uh, the supply of uranium is really a trivial issue. You can, in fact, buy participations in uh, uranium, which I have done. Uranium Participation Corporation is a Canadian company. Um, and then you can just calculate what you need in a lifetime and you can just buy it for a few, uh, couple hundred euros. So really, supply of uranium is uh, really trivial. Yeah, Maybe I, I can uh, connect the, uh, um, the two uh, economical and political uh, things with one question. Um, Rogier, you said societal costs are so high of not using nuclear, or at least the societal benefits can be great. Um, would that also mean that you imply that governments should take control themselves and society socialize energy production, maybe? And then well, how no, could the politics do that? that? Well, no, that's, that's I think, uh, we're stuck too far. My uh, ideological hero is Milton Friedman, and he famously said, if you let the government be in charge of the Sahara Desert, then in five years they will have uh, lost all of the sand. Um, but I think what you can do is uh, take a, a strong role for government, which I think is in the latest uh, VVD uh, uh, party uh, program as well, where you basically say, uh, as I said, the market, you can do everything by yourself. But we're setting the price. We're making sure that everyone who, uh, who produces CO2 pays for that, but also everyone who re reduces CO2 and can actually show that properly receives money for that. And as long as we uh, are very clear on that. So currently it's all over the place. Like the Tesla owner, my neighbor is getting 2000 euros per ton. But uh, when you charge the company, you only pay a tax of two euros per ton. The one thing the government needs to do is make sure these are all the same. And then just, and they can be very strict about that. Make sure that many companies are included in the trading uh, emissions trading system. Make sure we have, uh, we take very good care with uh, export and imports, uh, CO2 taxes, etc. But as soon as the government's done that, it should be hands off and let the market decide. And it will be, I, th I would, I'm pretty sure, actually, I've seen some studies that the total cost will be 40% less of the whole entire um, transition. So if we want to save money, just set the price and then let the market do its work. Okay, um, I think we have room for one last uh, question or remark. I see Andre Wacker has uh, joined us. Um, that's nice. Um, Andre, can you switch on your microphone? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. We can. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, I, I was actually, uh, let's say, um, my, my question is actually quite simple. No, first a remark. Um, let's not, let's not uh, forget. Uh, let's not forget that uh, we here in Europe built 150 nuclear power plants in 20 years time between 1970 and 1990. And let's be proud of that. My question is actually for the whole panel. Uh, based on what is going on in the Netherlands, we have um, two NGOs, uh, Urgenda and Milieudefensie. They are actually quite uh, successful in uh, suing Shell and suing, suing uh, the government for not reaching CO2 targets. My question is actually, uh, can we concern citizens, can we actually sue the EU for excluding and discriminating nuclear from the energy mix because it is not compliant, so to say, with the Paris Agreement. Basically killing the largest uh, uh, clean uh, 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 energy source we have. Uh, can we concerned citizens actually claim that this is against the Paris Agreement? Uh, Matthijs, I see you want to answer to that. Yes, because this is something that I've been talking to 
you, you know, se several several people, among others, you know, in, in Belgium and in Germany, because because we can see what is happening in in Germany and in Belgium right now, and there is a scientific basis to show that what they are doing is actually hurting people. So the emissions from coal, the prolonged emissions from coal in Germany cause at least 16,000 deaths. Uh, this has been calculated scientifically by Pushka Karacha and uh, Mr. Sato from Columbia University, and they've published a paper about that. Now, the same can be said for Belgium. So basically, Tine van der Straat, who is the, who is the, who is the current uh, minister uh, uh, responsible for, for energy matters in Belgium, she says that it's better to, 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 to take, take offline the nuclear power plants and replace them with natural gas plants. Now, the, the benefit here is that natural gas plants aren't as bad as coal plants, but they still emit air pollution, which causes harm to people. So there's this, there's this, uh, this European convention of the rights of, 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 of the person, the man, um, and, and, and this has been used as a basis for several uh, prior uh, uh, lawsuits, which means that there's jurisprudence for it. We might even can go. We we might be even successful when we take the same approach as that Urgenda and Milieu Defense takes, and and take both Belgium and or Germany to court for. Yeah closing their nuclear power plants and leaving their coal-fired power plants open. Yeah. And next up, we can, we can indeed look at, for instance, the European Union. But, but that, that's a slightly, slightly more difficult because, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody else has a, has a good remark on that. But is, is uh, Matthijs, is something happening? Uh, is there money? Is there an initiative? Is there a route to, to a court, either in Brussels or in Berlin or whatever? Let's uh, ask the uh, experts from uh, Foratom. Maybe yes, I can comment on that. Yes, so thank you very much. Of course, that is a question that we've kind of been asking ourselves. Well, well what happens if they take this political decision and nuclear is left out of the taxonomy? Um, we have to be clear on this. If anyone is going to take the, the commission to court, it, uh, so to the European Court of Justice, it would need to be the companies. The reason being that basically it's the party that has been uh, negatively affected from a business perspective by incorrect legislation. So because the, and this comes back to the point that I was making, the taxonomy regulation stipulates that the taxonomy must meet the principle of technology neutrality. Therefore, if they take a political decision to exclude nuclear, and as a result, nuclear companies are penalized and therefore they lose access to funds, for example, they can then take the European Commission to court because they would have a justified case to do so. As citizens, I see that as a very, there's, there's very little that I can see citizens being able to do in front of the European Court of Justice. But citizens can intervene in another way. The European Commission, when it launches legislation or it comes up with proposals, it runs public consultations. And I would really encourage you when there is a public consultation to try and get as many people from, from society, regardless of what industry they work in, regardless what their background is, to respond to those public consultations and express their views to the European Commission. For example, the Complementary Delegated Act. Once it comes out, there will be a one month public consultation. Citizens have the right to respond to that public consultation. And finally, members of the European Parliament. Members of the European Parliament are elected by their national citizens. So you need to make sure that at the next European Parliament elections, you vote for those uh, Dutch politicians who really can best represent your views at Brussels. And this is something I also insist on because we see that in these parliamentary elections, there's very low turnout across the different member states. If people don't vote, then they can't have their voice heard in the European Parliament. So please, we need to encourage people to be voting for the politicians that they think best represent them at EU level. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And I think this is a very nice uh, closing uh, uh, remark for this, uh, for this uh, webinar. 
Um, I think it may be a very nice idea to uh, to organize a, a webinar in the next season uh, after the summer holiday uh, about the question or, or about whether we as citizens uh, what we could do legally against the closure of uh, nuclear power plants that are uh, preventing the emissions of CO2. Um, for now, uh, I let me share my screen for the, as a closure. Yeah. Um, I would like to say a huge thank you to all the speakers for the valuable insights they have shared with us tonight. I would also like to thank uh, Jan Hertema and Silvio Erkens for being with us. Uh, no agenda, I think, is more contested for than politicians, and uh, your presence was greatly appreciated. And of course, you, ladies and gentlemen, listeners and voters, who, is, who are the essence of all public activity, and everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this uh, webinar possible. Luciano, Rudy, Walter, thank you. Finally, this. Web, these webinars cost money. If you think it is important that we can continue uh, them, uh, that we can continue them, please support Elisa with your donation. Not only do we have the MB status, we finally also have our own bank account where your donation is most welcome. If you also send us a message, if you donate, we can thank you nicely. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope to see you on our next webinar.